This is the introduction to the immune system lab in the cell structure and function course. The goals of this immune system video are to help you to begin to identify white blood cells that are ca categorized either as granulocytes or agranulocytes. We also would like to help you understand the flow of lymph through lymph nodes. We'd like you to understand the structure of the thymus and to introduce you to how the blood flows through the spleen as it is filtered by the spleen. This first slide is a composite of three of your images in the histoatlas. At the upper left, we have an image of two neutrophils. These are unusual in that their nuclei have a multi-lobed appearance. Up to now, you've been familiar with looking at cells that have a either round or perhaps oval nucleus, but now we're going to show you cells that have some rather unusually shaped nuclei, and that's helpful indeed because it allows you to identify the cells in blood smears, and it will be useful to you and to the technicians that do these exams for you because it will be an indicator of whether the percent of these cells in the blood is increased, indicating some kind of infection. So these cells, both of these cells, are neutrophils or polymorphonuclear um, cells. And an additional cell type that you will see that you saw very briefly in the cell biology video and lab was the eosinophil, which is so-called because it normally stains quite brightly uh, with a stain called eosin, which is has a pink or red color. It also is unusual in that it looks like it has two nuclei, but indeed it doesn't. It is simply a bilobed nucleus. So that's the eosinophil. And then down here at the bottom, at slightly higher magnification, we have a cell called the basophil, which is quite rare in terms of its occurrence in the blood. Uh, and it has the unusual appearance that it has so many vesicles in its cytoplasm that you can't clearly see what the shape of the nucleus is. So this is a basophil. And these three cells are what we call granulocytes. They are, the granules are vesicles in the cytoplasm of these cells, and the vesicles contain different proteins or other substances. Um, but because they have these granules, they are all three cell types are referred to as granulocytes. There are two other cell types that are found in the blood smear. One of these is the lymphocyte. This is an image which shows what we call a small lymphocyte because it has a very heterochromatic nucleus and it only has a very thin rim of cytoplasm and it's about the same size as the red blood cell which is adjacent to it. As you will learn in as you study the immune system, this small lymphocyte uh, will become activated and expand in size and depending upon whether it's a T cell or a B cell will go on to participate in uh, an immune response. The T cells are cell mediated immunity and the B cells produce antibodies for antibody mediated immunity. Down below here we have quite a large cell compared to the adjacent red blood cells. This is a monocyte it also has a odd shaped nucleus that is most often described as horseshoe shaped. This cell has the capability of 
becoming a, a macrophage when it leaves the blood and enters into the connective tissue space. And the lymphocytes and the monocytes are what we call agranulocytes because they don't have vesicles in their cytoplasm like the granulocytes do. So this is the lymphocyte and the monocyte. So now we're going to go on and look at the thymus. The thymus is an important organ in the body. It is the site where T cells, which are immature when they arrive from the bone marrow, undergo what we call education or maturation to become cells that are capable of responding to an immune stimulus. The structure of the thymus is it has a very dark staining cortex and these um, different bits or lobules of the thymus are separated by connective tissue septa and associated with the cortex are portions of the medulla which are lighter staining and then the connective tissue septa are even lighter staining because they're not anywhere near as cellular. So down here, over here, for comparison, we have the dark staining cortex surrounding a central lighter staining medulla, and the entire structure is surrounded by a very light staining connective tissue space. What you may note is that even though the cortex is distinct within each of the lobules, the medulla, as you can see here, is continuous throughout this organ, uh, and that is uh, something that is unique to this particular organ. So what we're going to do now is look at higher magnification in a portion of the medulla which is in the circle. So this is a low to medium magnification light micrograph of a region of the medulla. We don't see any cortex here. All of these little dark dots are nuclei of small lymphocytes. And the very high percentage of these cells are T lymphocytes, which are either entering into the thymus having come from the bone marrow, or perhaps they have recently come out of the cortex. And then we have these odd-shaped, irregular, irregularly shaped structures. And these structures are called Hassel's corpuscles. These structures are made up of cells called epithelial reticular cells. The structure, the cellular structure of the cortex and the medulla is created by these epithelial reticular cells. They're very difficult to see as individual cells because they are obscured by the very large numbers of T lymphocytes that exist um, essentially on top of them. And the epithelial reticular uh, cells are functionally important in terms of educating uh, or encouraging the maturation of the T lymphocytes as you have learned about in lecture. So now we're going to move on from the thymus, the structure of the thymus and its cellular components, to the lymph node. The lymph node is a filter for the lymph. So we learned in cardiovascular system one about lymphatic vessels, which are responsible for accumulating the fluid from the connective tissue space, which when it is in the lymphatic vessel is called the lymph. Uh, it's essentially serum and other fluids that flow in the lymphatic vessels. <clears throat> 
and these lymphatic vessels at intervals encounter lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes are a place where substances that are in the lymph can be filtered and removed largely by macrophages. And this is also a location where an immune response can occur to substances that are in the lymph. So the structure of the lymph node, starting at the left, is a capsule. This is a connective tissue capsule. And it wraps around the entire lymph node, which is roughly the shape of a kidney bean. And then just inside the capsule, in what we call the cortex, are these structures of B cells and T cells that we call lymph nodules. And the cortex and these B cells and T cells extend down into what's called the medulla of the lymph node. And these, uh, these extensions of the cortex in the medulla are called medullary cords. And they have the same dark staining appearance as the cortex. And they have similar components to the cortex that is B cells and T cells. As the lymph flows through the lymph node, it first enters at the cortex through little openings in the connective tissue capsule. And lymph flows into an area that we call a sinus, which is basically a vessel. It's a confined space wrapped by endothelial cells. And the lymphatic fluid flows from the subcapsular sinus into a structure called the peritrabecular sinus, indicated by the arrow here, because this extension of the capsule is called a trabecula. Then this is peri, or next to the trabecular sinus. And as you can see, the continuing blood, excuse me, lymph flow will go down into the medulla, into what are called medullary sinuses. And it's in the medullary sinuses that any antigenic material, which we often refer to as bulk antigen, is consumed, is recognized and consumed by macrophages. And you will learn from Dr. Welch about how, what, um, receptors are on macrophages that help them recognize things that are not part of the body so that the macrophages can then engulf or phagocytose and digest that material. As the lymph continues to flow, it goes towards the opposite side of the lymph node, which is called the hilum, which often has um, adipose connective tissue in it, and then from the medullary sinus, it flows out and continues its way uh, towards the thoracic duct, where the lymph re-enters the blood system. The blood flow in the lymph node starts at the hilum and runs in the opposite direction inside these connective tissue trabeculae, and then it flows up into the cortex, forms a capillary bed, and then flows back down in the connective tissue trabeculae, and then out through the hilum. The lymph nodes occur uh, in various places, such as the armpit or axilla, uh, and in the neck. And there are also other lymph nodules that are uh, permanent structures within the body. One of these is the tonsil. And what we're looking at here is a tonsil. You can see a number of lymph nodules. And this performs the same function as the lymph node, but it doesn't have a capsule. And the uh, flow of the lymph is not as easily defined here, the sinuses are not easy to see. 
It doesn't have a medulla uh, like the lymph node does. Uh, but these lymph nodules are set up in roughly the same uh, configuration with B cells and T cells. And it is in here that an immune response can be initiated by exposure of antigen, in this case from food that you have swallowed, uh, to B cells and T cells for activation of both the cell-mediated immunity response as well as the antibody-mediated immune response. So someone with tonsillitis would have a swelling of all of these lymph nodules due to a chronic infection and the associated immune response that is associated with that infection. Now I mentioned the blood flow in the uh, lymph node and that it forms a capillary bed in the cortex of the lymph node in the area of the lymph nodule. In the blood are many small lymphocytes that we looked at earlier in this video. And the small lymphocytes don't have an important function in the blood because the blood moves very rapidly and antigen presentation is not efficiently uh, performed in the blood. So what the lymphocytes do instead of staying in the blood and circulating in the body is that they leave the blood and enter, excuse me, a lymph nodule. And how they do that is through a specialized structure called a high endothelial venule, which occurs immediately after a capillary bed in the cortex of a lymph node. So what we can see in this very high light micrograph image are a number of small lymphocytes that I'm pointing out here. And these are still in the blood space. And they recognize these unusually thick or tall endothelial cells. Normally endothelial cells are squamous and dark, but in the high endothelial venules these cells stick up and the lymphocytes in the blood recognize them and associate with them using cell adhesion molecules and then what they actually do is to leave the blood and crawl in between the endothelial cells to enter the cortex of the lymph node or the area of the lymph nodule. And it is in the lymph nodule that these cells can actually be exposed to antigen and then if they recognize that antigen can respond to it by the appropriate antibody or the appropriate immune response. So that's the structure of the lymph node and how lymphocytes and lymph travel in the lymph node and in lymph nodules. Now let's look at how the blood is filtered as part of the immune system. This is a very low magnification light micrograph of the spleen. Like the lymph node, the spleen has a connective tissue capsule, which is this green structure at the top. You can see that it is quite thick and it sends projections of this connective tissue into the center of the spleen. These structures are also called trabeculae and they can be seen as these green structures found uh, throughout the center of the spleen. And what we need to understand since this structure's function is largely to filter the blood and remove antigens from the blood is how the blood flows. So from the aorta, the splenic artery flows into the hilum of the spleen and it runs, the blood in the arteries run in these connective tissue septa, much like the lymph node, but these are larger structures. Uh, these are actually arteries rather than arterioles. So the blood comes in this way. Uh, we can't see the hilum, but that's not important. So this is a trabecular artery in which blood is flowing. 
and then it branches and it flows into what's called a central artery which is normally more like an arteriole in size and that can be seen for example over here at the right here is a central artery in longitudinal section and this is continuous from the trabecular artery and then from there blood flows out into what's called the red pulp and the red pulp is where the red blood cells do not are not surrounded by endothelial cells rather they are surrounded by connective tissue and in that connective tissue space are macrophages which can consume old red blood cells and anything uh, that is antigenic in the serum this arrow indicates that blood flow can also go through uh, another portion of the spleen which is the immune portion of the spleen which stains differently so the red blood red pulp is always easily distinguished because it's full of red blood cells and stains red for the most part and there's another area which stains more of a pale or grayish color and this is called the white pulp because it contains the white blood cells so from the central artery you can get blood flow directly out from the central artery out into the red pulp or the blood can leave the central artery and migrate through capillaries in the white pulp and then ultimately end out end up in the red pulp here is a cross section of white pulp surrounded by red pulp this green structure is a central artery which has smooth muscle cells it's probably more about the size of a an arteriole but due to the staining it's difficult to count the smooth muscle nuclei but you can see red blood cells here at the center and surrounding smooth muscle cells surrounding this vessel are T cells and B cells and these occur in a fashion where the T cells are immediately adjacent to the central artery and the B cells are further out so uh, what happens is that capillaries which branch off the central artery uh, proliferate or not proliferate but flow out uh, to the edge of the white pulp which I'm indicating here with the arrow and this is an area called the marginal zone or marginal sinus where the endothelial cells of the capillary simply end and the blood flows out into the connective tissue space which is called the red pulp again the red pulp can be easily distinguished because of the abundance of red blood cells that accumulate in this connective tissue space in the marginal zone or marginal sinuses are antigen presenting cells and what happens is that the T cells here uh, and the B cells both migrate out to the marginal zone to see if they recognize any of the antigens that are in the blood and if they do then they can be then they can initiate either a cell mediated immune response or an antibody mediated excuse me immune response we have now looked at the organs of the immune system as well as the cells of the immune system so what I'd like you to do now is to complete your study of this lab and then as usual test your knowledge of what you have learned through the Learn at UW quizzes and through interactions in small groups to test yourself for prior to the um, bonus quizzes and the exam.